Montaz. Uh, good evening, everybody, and um, it's a pleasure that I will be presenting uh, a very nice topic to my heart, uh, the management of Air League uh, interoperatively, and uh, it will be continued on with Dr. Shadi, who will present the management of Air League post-operatively. Uh, it's a very important topic as we face this problem um, on a daily basis and sometimes uh, uh, intra-op and sometimes post-op. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, inform that I have nothing to disclose. I have no affiliation with any company uh, or any project that I'm presenting here. Uh, my presentation outline will be, uh, initially I will define, introduce the concept of air leak. Then we'll move on to the, uh, explore the causes of air leak. Then we'll start to uh, to discuss the preventing uh, prevention of air leak, uh, followed by management of intraoperative air leak. Then we'll uh, explore the new modalities to control the air leak, and then uh, some precautions that we should follow, uh, especially by our anesthetist. Uh, to prevent air leak. So the definition of air leak is quite challenging perspective in this time and, uh, and age, because previously it was uh, defined as resistant air leak for more than five days. But at that time, thoracotomy was performed. And it, it, now the practice is moving into minimal invasive and the patients are leaving the hospital way earlier than before. Most of the time, the surgeon can predict if there will be air leak or not. And this can be uh, predicted by assessing the CT scan of the patient, uh, seeing if there is multiple emphysematous disease or bullas, or even intraoperatively when initially they start dissecting for a lung resection, they will feel that the lung is giving way and uh, the, 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 there is some parenchymal injury with minimal maneuver or extensive adhesions, for example. It is one of the most important rate-limiting factors in discharging the patient from the hospital. Many doctors prefer to keep their patient in hospital with air leak. They can discharge them home with air leak, and uh, many patients will have difficulties in managing the air leak uh, in hospital because for them, they feel that everything is fine. It's just the tube in a place, and they can't do anything. I can't leave the hospital. So it is all also one of the most annoying complications that the surgeon can fall into. Um, almost 71% of the patient with air leak, it should be detected before the skin closure. The remaining will be detected post-extubation or when the patient is in uh, outside of the operating room. Working in harmony with anesthesia can help identify any air leak Intraoperatively, we, the anesthetist can uh, notify you that, oh, I have air leak or uh, if they find a, anything unusual during their uh, ventilation. So by definition, the most acceptable definition at the current time of, and age of VATS, as I mentioned earlier, is the reason why the patient stay in the hospital. And it's the reason why the patient still having a chest tube. Uh, in a place. Scientifically, the definition that was agreed upon between the Society of Thoracic Surgeon and the European Society of Thoracic Surgeon is a prolonged air leak beyond five days postoperatively. And this definition, the scientific uh, definition, is quite elastic because nowadays with bats, how many of us will keep their patients more than five days? But at that time when this definition was agreed, Read upon the gold standard was thoracotomy for, for example, lobectomy or uh, any other intervention requiring lung resection, and that will require the patient to stay in the hospital at least of five days. So they decided that the five days mark will be the uh, day where, if the air leak is present after that, will consider a prolonged air leak, and any time earlier is something that is. A very operative air leak. There are multiple classification of air leak. A uh, few of them is Sir Fellow uh, classification of air leak. He did, graded them one to four, and uh, he defines each grade with associated act. For example, in grade one, it's it's it happens only during 
force expiration only, and uh, grade two is all expiratory only, three is all expiratory, and four, which is continuous. Uh, sand classification of early uh, graded from zero to four. Uh, zero, there is no bubble. One, there is one air bubble present on a three serial volatile cough when you ask the patient to take deep breath and cough for three times. Uh, grade two is persistent air bubbles on volatile uh, coughs. Three, persistent small amount of air bubbles on spontaneous respiration. And four, persistent large amount of air bubbles on spontaneous respiration. As we, 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 we know that most of the causes are associated with the lung condition, uh, mainly patients with emphysema, uh, they, they are more prone to air leak, patients with COBD, uh, patients on certain medication, for example, steroids, uh, chemotherapy, um, lower FEV, FEV1 is found to be associated with uh, as a predictive value that the patient might develop uh, intraoperative or postoperative early. Uh, most common procedure that is associated with uh, air leak, intraoperative air leak, is upper lobe prosections because sometimes you need to divide the fissure, and when you divide this fissure, you are causing parenchymal injury during your blunt dissection, and this will cause uh, air leak. Bilobectomy is also associated with higher uh, chances of air leak. Patients with uh, inflammatory lung disease require lung resection, they will have adhesions uh, in the pleural cavity, and those adhesions is one of the uh, most common associated factors of persistent air leak or intraoperative air leak. Uh, one of the most important things is technical. Technical, that means it's pertaining to the surgeon himself. Uh, if uh, a bit an experienced surgeon doing the dissection, if the surgeon is experienced, but he's rough with the tissue handling, and one of the most common associations is overgrasping of tissue, and this will cause injury of parietal and visceral pleura causing uh, air leak from the lungs. In worst case scenarios, failure of step line, for example, bronchial stomatesis. I unfortunately had a couple of patients uh, during my training. We, we, we faced this problem requiring a prolonged procedure as the stump was very short. And uh, they ended up, one of them ended up with a bilobectomy rather than just a lobectomy so because we couldn't get enough space to suture the stump back again. Uh, parenchymal injury, uh, again, this is one of the reasons why uh, we shouldn't uh, hold the tissue with force or roughly, and we should be very gentle with, uh, uh, with the lung tissues. And this can happen with a surgeon that is overgrasping everywhere in the lung, uh, and trying to push the lung away to give him more space to do the dissection, and he can injure the lung that the part of the lung that's staying in. Uh, another thing is ruptured pulley that is a small during surgery that we didn't notice during the procedure, and uh, this happened as well many t for many of us. Uh, and one of the dreaded uh, injuries is airway injury, especially when you are doing a uh, lymph node station four right dissection. Uh, it's in, it's in a very close proximity to the trachea, and it happens that wh while you are using electrocautery or um, electrosurgery instruments, you will cause an injury to the airway that is will will exacerbate during the procedure and will end up with airway injury uh, a main airway injury tracheal injury that will require extensive uh, repair uh, another thing is uh, when uh, all of us we've been uh, through the the part where the junior will close the skin and close the muscle and they don't close the muscle very well this will form a sucking wound uh, mechanism because of the physiological uh, negative pressure of the uh, intrapleural space, and this will cause persistent air leak. Although it's not from the lung, it's not from the airway, it's not from 
the procedure itself, but it's related to a gaping wound that will allow air to enter from the atmosphere into the blurred space, then come back out through the uh, chest tube. Uh, one of the uh, also the, the 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 worst case scenarios. If you you, you check everything, you are hundred percent sure that the the bronchus is fine, everything is intact, the lung is fine. Then you end up checking the tube, and there was a stitch going through the tube, or the two one of the holes is at the skin level uh, of the chest tube. How to prevent it? Best treatment of air leak is to prevent it. If an anticipated act early, meticulous and careful techniques, delicate tissue handling, and usage of stapler for fused or non-complete fissures, i.e. fissureless lobectomy. And this practice of fissureless lobectomy is get, gaining more uh, becoming more popular among surgeons because it, it, it significantly decreased the intraoperative air leak and uh, any other com associated complication. Uh, and this is study we show, we see some uh, blood uh, graphs showing multiple techniques that they used to prevent intraoperative uh, uh, intraoperative uh, uh, air leak. Uh, that the the surgeons used a blue tinting technique to prevent that, knowing that beforehand that this patient will most likely develop air leak and they did it uh, prophylactically. Again, we'll start with some modality to manage the interoperative air leak. Uh, let's say that you had a patient, you, the patient underwent right upper lobectomy, uh, interoperatively were done, everything was fine. Then you found that there is a bronchial injury on the middle lobe that is leaking air, and you want to manage that. You have multiple options. Many of us will just take a couple of stitch with the um, and seal it. But at this time and age, we have more uh, weapons in our arsenal, and we can use those new technologies to help us uh, prevent air leak. Uh, for example, the uh, sealants that is being advertised by many companies that is the preventers of air leak after the lung section. And they advise that, yeah, just to spread it all over uh, the raw surface. If you have any raw, raw surface, uh, spray, uh, spray it on the uh, bronchial stump and it will stop uh, the air leak. For us as a thoracic surgeon, the ideal sealant should be easy to use. We can apply it on a blood or, or air leak field. Fast reaction, complete, complete sealant, non-toxic to the patient, resist infection, and biodegradable. That is almost the holy grail. That is almost never happening. Rice and Blackstone reviewed many sealants and concluded that there is no reliable efficiency of sealants. Fibrin-based sealants were associated with reduced air leak duration and occurrence, but didn't change the length of hospital stay. And that was found in seven randomized controlled trials. Although the patient population was minimal, but they found out that the fibrin-based sealants were not associated with the shorter hospital stay. Polyethylene glycol and GA sealant, as well as albumin-based, showed reduction in rates of air leak. But this study's population as well are limited, and they didn't show any significant decrease in hospital stay. In this forest plot of meta-analysis, they saw that the, the outcome of air leak in patients who used sealant, and uh, it shows that there is, there is no much differences between the control and the vapor glue or batch, and for most of those studies, there was no significant increase, uh, decrease in the hospital state. One of the new technologies that's been around and used by uh, our colleagues in bariatric surgery is the staple line buttressing or this uh, reinforced staple line. Uh, it used to be bovine pericardium and then became a BTFE strips. Uh, we use it mainly for LVRS patients, uh, especially in severe emphysema, because we believe that if we have this reinforcement, it will prevent the stable from having extra space to move around and it will help to spread the compression 
all along this sepal line equally. There are three small RCTs, randomized control trials, that showed very modest benefits. benefits. And they found that bovine pericardium was associated with late onset infection. Patients would, would present with hemoptysis and also pseudotumor formations. One of the previously mentioned and one of the old techniques that is uh, mentioned in the textbooks is pneumoperitoneum, where the, especially in bilobectomy cases, they will insert a catheter into the abdomen and they will inject about 500 cc of air under the diaphragm using a catheter. And usually it's done daily to help increase the intra-abdominal pressure elevating the diaphragm to obliterate the space that uh, occurred after a bilobectomy. And this will help in creating a pleural space opposition that will prevent or decrease the chances of air leak. Uh, you can see it's a very old chest x-ray because it's all mentioned in all textbooks, but you can see the progress of subphrenic air in photo number A. You can, uh, the, the, the lung is uh, almost uh, collapsed. There is a whole uh, blur space. And in, uh, sorry, in A is uh, preoperative. In B, you can see the lung is uh, almost uh, uh, free in the space. You can see the edges up here. And the, the below the clavicle, and there is basilar space. While the chest tube in very good position, and it should be draining. But given that the patient underwent uh, lobectomy and uh, uh, moderately above normal sized lobe, there was a basilar space. And you can see in photo no, uh, uh, number C uh, that there was increase in the uh, intra-abdominal air and there is an uh, elevation of the diaphragm. This created obliteration of the space in photo number D, and this allowed the lung to oppose the pleural space. One of the new modalities also that uh, it was described in literature recently, and I saw it, that uh, the insertion of endobronchial valves. When you anticipate that, the patient will have post-operative air leak for a reason that is associated with his lung condition, lower of EV1, or the, you know that the procedure will uh, entail uh, extensive dissection and uh, there is a high risk of parenchymal injury, uh, you can insert to the most common uh, bronchus, uh, bronchial valve that will act as a one-way valve allowing the air to come out rather than going in. And, and uh, this will help uh, preventing that if anything happened later on after the surgery, the patient is protected and that the air leak shouldn't be a concern. Uh, and if it's, the patient is fine, you can take it out in the same setting. Uh, there is a small case series uh, uh, associated with endo endobronchial valve that showed generally favorable uh, results. The only issue with that technique, the valve itself, it's quite expensive and it should be inserted by trained uh, thoracic surgeon or intervention in uh, pulmonologist. And they are not quite there yet. Uh, there, are, there are a few who's able to do it. And one of the most significant advantages of this procedure is that the valve the valve can be inserted bronco uh, by bronchoscopy during the procedure, before the procedure, and can be removed during the procedure or after the procedure, and even doesn't require hospitalization. Even if you discharge the patient with the, the bronchial valve, the patient doesn't require re-admission to uh, assess the, um, to remove the valve. And uh, Dr. Shadi will be, I'm sure he will be talking about this, but one of the uh, the issues that sometimes you will end up reoperating the patient and the patient will require re-exploration. And the, the best way to avoid that is if you, if, if you are suspecting air leak, you can do the submerged test where you will 
submerged the lung under saline, as mentioned in the textbook. I personally prefer sterile water because sterile water wouldn't react with any bleeding or anything and will give you a good visibility, especially with vats. And can, a leak tests can be done with anesthesia, asking them to encephal- uh, inflate the lungs uh, with a sustained airway pressure of 35. And if you are able to identify the leaking site, you can staple it, suture it, seal it, batch it. You can do whatever you want and whatever you are comfortable with. And uh, and one of the most important things is that if you had closed the chest and you found that the patient is having air leak and you re-explore, even if the patient is in the same position and the chest tube is just now inserted, you have to insert a new chest tube uh, and make sure that the chest tube is in optimal position. Uh, one of the things that if you, if you, if you are performing a bilobectomy, especially in bilobectomy surgeries, and uh, there, there is a space that is anticipated and with any other technique that is you are utilizing is not, you are not able to obliterate the space. One of the things that it should be considered is the usage of flaps, muscle of flaps, interposition of flaps, tents, for example, burr tent. This is one of the easily done and most effective with a chest tube under the tent and chest tube on, on top of the tent and other space occupy technique. For example, uh, whenever we, are, we do a frightomenectomy and we are suspecting that there is a, a, a minimal risk of a right uh, nemenectomy syndrome, uh, we will use the space occupying uh, uh, fillers, for example, the uh, breast uh, implants to, to, to obliterate the space and prevent any uh, herniation of the heart or any twisting of the heart. So this is one of the space occupying techniques. Uh, also, and, uh, pneumoperitoneum is considered one of the space occupying technique, and this be, should be reconsidered in any patient that you are anticipating a massive space or a space that is not going to be filled with, by the uh, re-expansion of uh, the remaining lung. One of the new modalities, as I discussed previously, endobronchial valve, this is one of the new and novel techniques. There are a few literature reviews on that. And as I mentioned earlier, it is one of the uh, most promising uh, uh, new modalities to prevent air leak. But it is, on the other hand, it is expensive. Uh, it requires some, some sort of training to be able to insert the valve. Uh, BTFE, uh, BTFE sheets, it's currently it's be, being used by uh, our colleagues in obstetrics and gynecology to prevent adhesions. But this sheet can be cover, uh, covering uh, parenchymal injury, and this will help uh, ac- accelerate the buildup of blur on top of that so that the, the, the within 72 hours, the blur will be building up and clo- uh, uh, covering this parenchymal injury. Uh, the staplers now is... Uh, uh, they, they, they come in three rows rather than double rows in previous uh, generation of the staplers. And all the companies now, they are providing those sta- three row staplers reinforced with BTFE. For example, Echelon, now they have their own uh, line of uh, buttressing, uh, Covidian as well. And also there are ma- many third party companies that will provide uh, buttressing for whatever stabler you are using. A less traumatic instrument. Now we can see that we, we, we are more diving into vats and we are doing more procedures uniportal. The instrument, if you can feel them with your finger, tip of the, your finger, you will find that they are now more smoother rather than traumatic as previously used instrument in open surgeries. And this is helping us to go further from causing any injuries to the lung. Uh, the use of ultrasonic devices and electrosurgeries, uh, those modalities helped us a lot. And uh, even the companies now, they are inventing more faster, uh, more precise, less heat spreading. For example, I'm not, again, I'm not affiliated with any company of those. Uh, for example, the Covidian is a bipolar uh, 
uh, electrosurgery device that has a minimal heat uh, transmission that prevent any injuries to the tissue nearby tissues, as well as the uh, harmonic, the new harmonic is uh, the 1000 or 1100. They have more focus heat transmission from a blade to another blade, thus decreasing the uh, heat spread, allowing uh, you to dissect close to important or uh, major uh, organs uh, without causing any injuries, thus causing a less uh, injury to uh, lung bronchima or uh, heat uh, injury to lung tissues. Anesthesia consideration, this is the last slide. Uh, this is one of the most important things is to have open channel communication with your anesthetist. This will help giving them idea and uh, they know that you are suspecting this lung tissue is very friable and you require that they should go on slow and controlled recruitment rather than all of a sudden increase the valsalva and airway pressure of 40 or 50 and immediately you will see in the front of your eyes the staple line just bursting open and this is the last thing you want. Uh, maintaining a low intrabronchial airway pressure to prevent parotrauma. And they have the, chan the, 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 the tools to tell you, oh, uh, I'm giving a, a 300 cc of air, but I'm getting back at 200. This is a very good indicative that there is 100 cc of lost air, and it is most likely associated with unnoticed uh, and uh, air leak that should be reassessed and the best way to do it is submerge the lung in underwater uh, or saline and uh, ask them to inflate the lung and this will help you to identify uh, unseen uh, air, uh, lung injuries or bronchial injuries or even uh, stable line failures. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Isa, uh, for this uh, good and very illustrative uh, talk. Uh, I think you cover all the points of uh, intraoperative uh, air leak, and you uh, uh, enter anesthesia with you. It is a good uh, point <laughs> to not... Uh, catch the risk, uh, the doctor only, the surgeon only. Uh, so you uh, make the anesthesia share with you in this uh, field. Thank you. Uh, we have many uh, questions in uh, the chat. Uh, I think Dr. Isa can show uh, the question or read the question uh, until we uh, finish with uh, the next uh, professor, Dr. Shadi, who will speak us about the post-operative. He will complete uh, the line that we start interoperative. Then we uh, go to the post-operative. Please, Dr. Shadi. Actually, I will continue uh, about the management of post-operative uh, prolonged air leak. You can, Dr. Isa, tfaddal wuhaka an pre-operative and intraoperative assessment. And actually, what, what is uh, uh, worrisome for a surgeon is the post-operative uh, air leak. And this is what will be um, uh, the, the 15 or 20 minutes uh, that we will spend together. Um, I have nothing to disclose. And the outline of my, uh, of my talk is about uh, introduction, definition, and classification, maybe just already said uh, by Dr. Isa and some of the risk factors and management options. We all know that the post-operative leak is one of the most common complications uh, after lung resection. It can reach up to 50%, and in some reports, 60%. And actually, after volume um, uh, lung reduction, some, some of the reports, they have reported around 80 to 90% of post-operative air leak. Post-operative air leak does not mean a persistent or prolonged air leak. We will, we will come to the definitions later. Uh, as we all know, the, the air leak is the egress of air from the parenchyma of the lung it, due to uh, a defect in the lung itself or uh, a bronchial stable line or a stable line in the, in the lung parenchyma. Luckily, most of the air leaks, they were resolved spontaneously. And 
if they did not resolve, this will contribute to a prolonged post-operative pain, prolonged hospital stay, prolonged cost, uh, pro, uh, increased cost, and other risks like pneumonia, infection, and an overall patient uh, dissatisfaction. So one of the things that, that the surgeon should be aware of, that prevention and or treatment of post-operative early is a crucial component of the perioperative care for patients uh, undergoing pulmonary resection. So as Dr. Isa mentioned earlier, that the uh, post-operative air leak is defined the prolonged or persistent if it's more than five to seven days. And um, uh, there is a consensus statement from the European Society of Thoracic Surgery and um, uh, Society of Thoracic Surgeons that if if the leak persists more than five days, it's defined as prolonged or persistent. Other definitions or other group or other research groups, they define persistent air leak as more than seven days, especially if they are dealing with uh, lung volume reduction. Other research group, especially Sir Folio and his colleagues, they defined air leak as any leak that delays the hospital discharge. If we stuck to the strict definition, that is more than five days, it will help us in, in delineating what's a prolonged, what's persistent, and what is um, self-limiting uh, air leaks. There are three major factors to consider when we are initially evaluating an air leak. Uh, those those three factors are the volume, duration, and the trend of leak. And for example, a larger air leak that has been present longer with, without any improvement has a low likelihood of resolution. Whereas a smaller air leak that is improving daily is more likely to resolve spontaneously. Uh, this is already mentioned by uh, Dr. Isa, that is the, the serfolio classification. Um, and there are proposed classifications, too many proposed classifications, but actually the most cited one is this one that is a serfolio classification and the other new one that is the Sang classification. Both, they depend um, on the air leak meter that indicates the degree of air leak measured in columns. This is especially uh, important uh, in SANG classification, while in serfolio classification, it's a completely subjective uh, assessment uh, if the air leak is during expiratory or inspiratory or continuous air leak. Recently, we have uh, a new digital chest drainage system that allows direct quantification of flow through the drainage system. These digital drainage devices display the flow in mil per minute, and as well as the pressure difference, maximum and min uh, minimum, I mean the, the plural pressure difference. If we want to inspect or to talk about the epidemiology of the post-operative air leak, we can find that up to 50 to 60% of patients who underwent uh, elective thoracic surgical procedure will experience some sort of air leak. But luckily, up to 50% of them, this will resolve in the post-operative day one. And by the post-operative day five, most of the leaks will be resolved. But up to 6 to 18% of the patients, air leaks will fail to resolve. And this is what makes the post-operative hospital stay longer, the cost is longer, the pain and it invites complications like infections or uh, empyema. Uh, as I said before, lung volume reduction surgery has associated with, with more risk. Uh, lobectomies, especially upper lobectomies, with, uh, it's around 10%. Uh, they, they will experience a persistent early which resection is less. We, we see a few patients after, after a transbronchial needle biopsy or transthoracic needle aspiration bias. If you want to manage the prolonged air leak or the persistent air leak, you, you should start by the risk assessment. Dr. Isa has talked about some, but I will uh, elaborate uh, one or two slides about the risk assessment. 
Interoperative management has been discussed in the previous lecture, and the, the main talk will be about the post-operative uh, treatment. Till now, there are no available guidelines about management of persistent air leak. Most of the studies, most of the research that's published, either it's a, a single center experience or it is a, a case series or something like that. We can find the solid guidelines that is published by the American College of Chest Physicians in 2001, that surgical evaluation for consideration of video-assisted thoracoscopic pleurodesis for prolonged air leak following spontaneous pneumothorax. And there is another guideline by the British Thoracic Society who stated that early thoracic surgical consultation on day three or four should be performed. And recently, we have a statement from the European Society of Thoracic Surgery in which this statement has proposed that an aggressive and early approach for a persistent air leak or prolonged air leak is recommended in case of a sudden start or increase of a large post-operative air leak, more than 400 milliliter per minute, in a patient who is previously having no or very minimal air leak. But unfortunately, there was no consensus on the choice of the treatment. And these data reflect the lack of evidence-based guidelines. If you want to assess the risk factors, uh, Dr. Issa mentioned uh, nearly all of them, but the risk factors of air leak are a little bit uh, different from risk factors for prolonged air leak. The, the risk factors for air leak are COPD, mainly emphysema, uh, low FEV1 if it's less than 70%, steroid use, smoking, male gender, uh, plural adhesions, low DLCO. But the risk factors for prolonged air leak are the number one, higher volumes of air loss if it's a grade four, continuous in nature, and leaks associated with collapse of the lung or with pneumothorax. There are too many. Uh, prediction models for the, the group of patients who will develop a persistent air leak. You can, you can see in the literature, um, if you review the literature, there are more than five studies who, who decided or who, who said that the, the plural adhesions, resection type, lower locations are predicting factors for prolonged air leak. More than five studies in which they stated that if EV1 and gender are so important, more than three studies in which there is a body mass index, age, and smoking are important facts. Back, uh, back to the prediction models, we will take one of the recent prediction models that is uh, done by Attar et al. This prediction model, Attar and his colleagues formulated a prediction model for a prolonged air leak with almost 80% accuracy. The model also stratifies patients into low, intermediate, and high-risk categories with persistent air leak rates of 2%, 9%, and 19%, respectively. And the prediction nomogram scored risk factors, including FEV1, procedure type, smoking status, performance status, Preoperative hospitalization, reoperation, and the procedures uh, via thoracotomy. Now, if you are facing a patient with a persistent or prolonged air leak, i.e., more than five days, you have several interventional treatment options to address a prolonged air leak. Although our preference is to manage pleural space using an outpatient chest tube. Other options include uh, chemical chlorodesis, autologous blood patch, placement of endobronchial valves, and uh, reoperation uh, using uh, topical sealants, pleural tents, wedge resection, etc. Traditionally, the use of, of suction postoperatively, minus 20 centimeter water, to the chest tube has been used by thoracic surgeons following lung, uh, lung resection. But recently, most of the surgeons are seeking for the evidence for this. So the, the thoracic surgeon has been divided or have been divided into two groups. One a group that suggests to use a minus 20 centimeter 
uh, suction, post-operative, and the other group that that use only an underwater seal without put, putting any, any negative suction. Many believe that water seal promotes healing of the air leak by decreasing the amount of air escaping out the lung, while others believe uh, that suction removes the air in the pleural space, allowing for a position between the parietal and visceral pleura. Since then, the use of suction versus water seal for post-operative air leads was first investigated by Sir Folio. I think it is 2001, uh, when they randomized 33 patients uh, who had air leak on post-operative day two after elective lung resection. He found that a group randomized to water seal, two-thirds of them had resolved their air leak on post-operative day three compared to only 7% of patients randomized to suction at minus uh, 20 centimeter water. So the conclusion was placing chest tube and water seal seems superior to wall suction for stopping air leaks after pulmonary resection. However, water seal does not stop expiratory leaks that are uh, four out of seven on, on uh, air leak meter or a greater, uh, a greater or in the presence of pneumothorax. Since uh, Sir Folio's uh, first randomized control study, another study uh, have shown or other studies have shown similar results, uh, such as the one published by uh, Marshall et al. He randomized 68 per, uh, patients right from the OR. إذا ملاحظ سير فوليو عملها in post-operative uh, day two but Marshall has started in post-operative day zero. The finding, he found that air leak sealing was significantly shorter in water seal group. It's 1.5 days compared to the suction group, uh, 3.3 days. With the same conclusion that you should not use suction unless you have a collapsed lung in brackets, pneumothorax or a persistent air leak. And his advice was to use a low uh, negative suction. I mean, minus five to minus 10 intrapleural negative. Other conservative uh, techniques that can be used and help uh, a thoracic surgeon to, to get the red out of, of this uh, persistent air leak is to pull back the chest tube away from the apex of the lung, especially if, the, if he is suspecting that the apex is, is the source of the air leak. And some, some of the methods that can be used is to, to increase the level of the water seal, to, to, to have what's called a pushback mechanism, and finally, to use uh, a Heimlich valve and sending your patient home. If, if these conservative managements fail, then there are multiple sealants currently in the market. One of them is a fibrin patch uh, that can be either synthetic or autologous. It is composed uh, of fibronogen, plasma uh, fibronectin, factor uh, eight, and the plasmonogen in, in a, a protein and solution. And this will be mixed with thrombin and calcium chloride uh, solution. Once the, the thrombin cleaves the fibronogen, this will end up with the final pathway of the clotting cascade. So this clot will help in, in a stoppage of the, of the uh, air leaks. Uh, as Dr. Isa mentioned, prophylactic intraoperative use has shown no significant difference in decreasing the post-operative leak. But if you have a post-operative leak, then you can use fibrin either uh, through the chest tube or thoracoscopically or even through a fiber optic bronchoscope. The benefits of, of uh, a fibrin patch, it's painless. It can be uh, given a bedside without any, uh, let us say, major side effects other than the risk of uh, a bloodborne uh, infection or antigenic reaction. And if it is done under full aseptic technique, the risk of infection will be very uh, minimal, although it is a good media for bacterial growth. Another technique that can be used in, in, in persistent um, 
air leak or prolonged air leak is autologous blood batch. Autologous blood batch and pleurodesis was first used by Robinson in 1987 for the treatment of prolonged air leak. Since that time, there have been multiple case series and two randomized controlled trials that showed a success rate of 92 to 93%. This procedure includes withdrawal of 50 to 100 cc of peripheral blood from the patient, and this blood will be injected under full aseptic technique into the pleural cavity through the chest tube. Then the chest tube will be either clamped, which is not advised to be to do so, or hooked over a drip stand so that the air can escape easily while the blood is kept in, inside the pleural space. And this will, will prevent uh, the formation or the development of attention pneumothorax. This procedure, as I said, has a, a good success rate. It, it, it has reached 92 to 90 it has been associated with risks like tension pneumothorax, pleuritis, and empyema. Uh, a third technique that can be used uh, uh, other than conservative fibrin or autologous blood is the chemical pleurodesis. You all know that the chemical pleurodesis is aimed to, to, to produce an inflammation and fibrosis between the visceral and parietal pleura. It treats the, the air leak and it helps a lot in, in preventing the recurrence. Despite the consensus that chemical pleurodesis is an effective tool in management of prolonged air leak for high risk in operable patients, researchers remain divided regarding the best pleural sclerosing agents. Some of you may use uh, talc, some may use tetracycline, but in the, the guidelines of the ACCP and the ATS uh, recommendation, they prefer uh, doxycycline due to the risk of ARDS that's associated with use, usage of the talc. The mechanism of action of, of doxycycline or even the chemical, other chemical agents like uh, pleomycin or other uh, sub, subgroups of doxycycline, they will damage the mesothelial surface and interfere with the repair and will promote fibrin deposition into the inflamed pleural space. As we all know, the risks of pleurodesis is pain. It is not a benign, minimally invasive procedure due to a severe post or post-procedural pain. It's associated with uh, sometimes with infection if you have a persistent pleural space or a wide pleural space. And if you use a talc as a chemical pleurodesis agent, ARDS is a possibility. Uh, the endobronchial valve is a one-way valve that are relatively new advancement in a prolonged early. And as Dr. Isa said, they can be used intraoperatively, but the most common use of these valves is in the post-operative period. They provide a safe and minimal invasive alternative to surgical correction in patients with high surgical risk. Endopronchial valves prevents air from entering pulmonary parenchyma distally while allowing air and secretions to travel proximally and thus uh, be drained. The occlusion of air distal lung segments causes isolated atelectasis, and this atelectasis will be um, uh, very effective in decreasing or stopping the air leak. Till today, we have uh, two FDA-approved uh, brands, and uh, these, these um, uh, endopronchial valves can be uh, installed in, uh, using a flexible bronchoscope with conscious sedation. The procedure usually started by localization where the source of air leak is. And this localization can, can be assessed by uh, the help of a Fugarty catheter in which the surgeon or the pulmonologist can um, block the segmental bronchi and then uh, see the, the leak meter or the digital uh, suction system. If there is no air leak, so he, he targeted or he hit the, the right target so he can insert the endobronchial valve easily. Uh, although it's expensive, um, there are reported cases that they insert up to 
six or eight uh, endobronchial valves. The recommendation by a large series that these valves should be removed after six to eight weeks, although there are uh, reported uh, series with permanent endobronchial valves. These two, two photos shows one of the endobronchial valves. This is the spiration one. And the other one is the, uh, that is uh, like a duckbell shape. Uh, this is the other type of, of endobronchial valve. The, the largest uh, uh, series that has used uh, endobronchial valve for a treatment of a persistent pulmonary air leak was conducted in, in the uh, period 2002 till 2007. They have recruited around 40 per, uh, patients from 17 international sites. And uh, the persistent air leak has resolved or decreased in 92.5%. Uh, in around 47.5%, there is a complete resolution, while uh, a reduction in 45% of, of, the, of the group. The adverse events of endobronchial valves, they have uh, reported valve uh, expectoration, moderate oxygen desaturation, initial uh, malpositioning of the valve that require redeployment, pneumonia, and MRSA colonization. Luckily, there is no reported mortality due to endobronchial valves. This table shows uh, the, the, the series of, of the different methods and techniques that uh, has been used uh, in, in management of patients with persistent air leak. If air leak persists despite conservative medical and endoscopic techniques, then operative intervention is likely required. Traditionally, an open uh, thoracotomy approach was used, but nowadays the mainstay of treatment is minimal invasive video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. This is often done through the same incision. Uh, the pulmonary resection was initially performed. And once the decision is made to take the patient to the theater, the first step is to identify the, the air leak site by a submersion uh, test. Then you can choose either to stable or to, to use a pleural tent, to use pleurodesis, or to do a combined uh, uh, procedure. I mean, stapling plus sealant, or stapling plus pleural tint, it depends on the intraoperative findings. This algorithm, I'm not sure if it's quite clear, has been proposed by uh, Sir Folio and his colleagues recently and published in Thoracic Surgery Clinics in, in 2021. Uh, actually, it summarizes what we have um, uh, said in the, in the previous uh, 20 slides. The take-home messages from the management of, of post-operative or persistent uh, post-operative air leaks that we should know it, it can occur in up to 50 to 60 percent of the patient. Luckily, most of, the, of them will resolve by day five post-operatively. The risk factors include um, uh, COPD, uh, mainly emphysema, low FEV1, if it's less than 70% opposite male gender, steroid use and nutritional status, if it's poor, pleural adhesions and upper lobectomies or bilobectomies. There are several methods to address air leak if it's persist uh, beyond five days, including outpatient chest tube management, which is the most common, or to use fibrin patch or uh, chemical pleurodesis or even surgery. Digital drainage system have shown to limit the inter-observer uh, variability regarding decision making for chest tube management and had equally shown to reduce length of a stay after pulmonary resection. Thank you for attention. We are to Thank you, uh, Dr. Shadi, for your very uh, beautiful and uh, illustrative talk about the uh, post-operative uh, management of the air leak. Uh, I think we cover uh, all the points intra-operative and uh, post-operative uh, air leak. And um, for the time, uh, I will start rapidly to discuss the audience about the uh, messages or question in uh, the message, Dr. Amir. 
اللي ليه سؤال بقى ممكن يعني هستاذن حضراتكم يتفضل يرفع ايده كده في قدامي في الدكتور رياض اتفضل دكتور رياض السلام عليكم مساء الخير جميعا ويعطيكم العافيه اتفضل ما فيك هلا رياض اول شيء شكرا جزيلا يعني على الجروب الرائع يعني وفعلا يعني فيري فاليوبل يعني دكتور شادي دكتور عيسى يعني ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور ذا نايت بيكتشرز Uh, you covered many things. Yani, I, ha- I have a comment, so I have a question. Uh, my comment, yani, <coughs> during yani, longer sections, especially for cancer surgery, some patients, uh, like you said, many adhesions, uh, patients after new adjuvant emphysema, so IPD. Yani, بشوف, أنا, مثلاً, you have to differentiate by two types of air leak. Yani. I will never leave the operator, operating room with air leak from the bronchial stump. يعني even if it's very minor I don't anticipate it to close يعني وفي المرضى اللي بيكون عامل مثلا major lung resection by lobectomy and uminectomy I usually cover this thumb with uh, with bedical lift flap and I prefer the uh, pericardial flap يعني pericardial fat pad bedical lift flap uh, parenchymal leak sometimes if it's small and you free the lung واللنج يعني ما في adhesions with fill the space Uh, yeah, and usually it will close, as you said, yeah, within one or two days. Yeah. But if you do maneuvers, yeah, I think Marat, you can uh, temporarily paralyze the phrenic nerve by injecting uh, xylocaine or lidocaine, or you can crush it with, uh, <coughs> yeah, with forceps. It causes temporary paralysis, especially when you have space. And, and, and by yeah, uh, decreasing the space, I think the air leak, Uh, will resolve uh, very fast. Oh, I, I, I appreciate your comment on that. Uh, the other, th- the, my question, <clears throat> what do you do if you have, you, ha- you don't have a lot of air leak, but you have a bad surgical emphysema and the lung is expanded after the surgery? What's your approach? Bad surgical emphysema. Hmm. طيب تفضل شكرا على الاسئله الجميله. طبعا of course nobody would leave the operating theater if there is even a slightest suspicion of leak from the bronchial stem. And whoever is, do, who, whoever is leaving the OR with the bronchial stem early, he should reconsider his choices, I think. It's always advisable to have some sort of a flab covering the bronchial stem when doing pneumonectomy or even by lobectomy. The, the, this is uh, the proper thing to be done. And one of the safest uh, flaps to be used is intercostal flap. It is the easiest one to obtain, and uh, it's easier to apply, but it's only accessible in thoracotomy. Uh, in VATS, it's advisable for, uh, as you mentioned, pericardial fat to be used, uh, or pleural flap. أنا ممكن ممكن أجابك على السؤال الثاني اللي هو موضوع السيرجيكال انفيزيما انا اي ثينك سيرجيكال انفيزيما وذ ان اكسباندد لونج ذس از ون اوف ذا ريليتيف انديكيشن تو يوز ا لو سكشن واي يو نو ذات ذا مانجمنت اوف سيرجيكال انفيزيما يو ار تريتينج ذا فاميلي راذر ذان تريتينج ذا بيشنت سو ون اوف ذا ثينجز ذات هيلب هيلب ذا سيرجن از تو بوت ا لو سكشن ذات از ما maximum uh, 15 centimeter water this will keep the lung expanded and will help in resolution of the of the surgical emphysema if it's persist without um, let us say a major air leak uh, maybe you can use um, uh, another chest tube in uh, another side because sometimes you have um, a leak Uh, that is not draining very well to the uh, already inserted chest tube. تمام هو عادة فعلا احنا ساعات بنلجا ان احنا نحط سكند chest tube بتساعد في ريليف للسيرجيكال انفيزيما. اتفضل دكتور ماسين. السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله. Thank you for the nice presentation. It was really interesting. I have a, just a question about uh, how to manage resistant subcutaneous emphysema, postoperative emphysema, uh, either with the, the second insertion of a case tube and uh, with a, a good uh, radiological imaging. So how can we do, uh, especially when the patient and his family are uh, frightened to see uh, the morphology is uh, becoming a bigger one? Dr. Shadi, you said that? I don't understand the question, Dr. Masin. How to manage the extensive subacute emphysema 
uh, despite uh, multiple chest tubes and yes. uh, Ah, okay. Uh, in, in the extreme scenarios of surgical emphysema, uh, uh, after you have used uh, chest tubes and suction, and uh, still you have a patient with, with uh, disfiguring emphysema, let us say, uh, this means that the leak is extremely high. Um, uh, and the, the best option, uh, if you have a source and a known source is to go back to the theater and correct the source. If if the patient is so fragile, then you can do a, two small supraclavicular incisions, or in some reports, they advise to insert a subcutaneous drain. I think in the literature, there is no more than five to seven cases in which they reported uh, the use of a subcutaneous drain. It's like a ready vac drain, or even you can connect it to water seal. Uh, it's either, doesn't make any difference. Actually, um, uh, I haven't seen this. Um, I have a trained in Germany in, uh, in a center who, in, in, in this center, they operated around uh, 1,500 cases per year. Um, they haven't used this technique um, uh, at all. Um, in Jordan here, I haven't used this technique at all. Maximum that I have done a small supraclavicular snips bilateral. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank, you. You. thank you. This is a very good approach. Um, I think the, the, the easiest one is to have um, supra, uh, supraclavicular incisions small steps that allow the air to vent uh, and uh, you should understand what is the underlying cause yes yes of course Dr. Samir, thank you thank you uh, Samir, thank you thank you I want to just share with some discussions based on my experience with my colleagues. In this middle after the subcutaneous emphysema, and I would go up with the digital suction to minus 40. If it's not improving, then insert another chest tube on a second intercortical space. My comment about the subject is that in cases of the diffuse emphysema test lung disease or lung volume reduction surgery. Here, it's a challenging position, a challenging situation to go for surgery, especially with a stapled. Even though sometimes I starting using mesh with glue to fixing over the stapler line to minimize air leak. آخر نقطة مع الدكتور بالنسبة للأنستيزيا البونت الأنستيزيا أنا أنا بس بدعتي مسج لأنه based on my training. I got two cases with airway injury by an by anesthesiologist. Sometimes, if the trial of W intubation extended more two to three times, you should think about airway injury. آخر نقطة مع الدكتور شادي. I disagree with you في شغلة اللي هي موضوع blood patch. نسبة عالية جدا انت حاطة توقع بالliterature eighty to ninety percent manage air leak. In practical wise, I didn't think the successful rate لها الدرجة لا تمانين تسعين بالمية. وآخر نقطة التالك بلوروديسيس ثيوريتيكالي مكتوب بسوي ARDS لكن براكتيكال I didn't see any case with ARDS after التالك بلوروديسيس بعد شو انتو خبرتكم هل شفتوا حالة ARDS after التالك I don't know بسمع منكم دكتور دكتور سامر اللي هو التعليق على البلود باتش والضوء انه في كيس سيريز بس في في راندومايز كنترول ستاديز Uh, we randomized control studies, but it's a strong evidence. Lanihki uh, il percentage. It is 90%, it's 90%. I don't think uh, one of us and a couple of cases can yukum ala had il percentage be wujud randomized control studies. Hala bin nisbila talk, it is an ACCP recommendation. Uh, sorry, it's not a recommendation, it's a guideline. Uh, that's doxycycline, it's preferable, although the success rate is less than the TAL. And this is also supported by recommendation from the Society of Thoracic Surgeons that uh, doxycycline or its derivative is uh, preferable to the TAL due to uh, the risk of, of uh, ARDS. Um, if you haven't seen an ARDS, you are lucky, but um, the, the people who will see an ARDS after talc pleurodesis, those who, who operate upon pleural mesothelioma patients or who do a pleurodesis quite common with talc. 
so it's reported in the literature that ARDS can happen if you take the autopsy studies after a talc pleurolysis. In the autopsy, they found talc in the brain tissue. They found talc in the lung parenchyma. They found talc also in the liver parenchyma. And this is why most of the authorities and the societies against talc pleurolysis. I agree with you. يعني أنا شخصيا في حالة حصل لها ARDS من البلوريديسز بالتالك بس هي one case بس طبعا one case is enough because the ARDS has a fatality rate of 50 to 70% so one case is enough one case is enough to say it is not advisable it's not contraindicated but it's not a preferable not preferable بالضبط كده بالنسبة للبلود we perform pleurodesis using Pleomycin or mechanical pleurodesis. Uh, during my training, they relate heavily on talc, talc slurry, and 50% glucose. Also, one of the interesting things whenever we are doing a surgery, uh, I, I do it myself, uh, is dilute some betadine with a, a saline and wash the chest with betadine and saline. Betadine has the tendency to create a inflammatory response to the pleura. And this will create a good pleurodesis that is not as aggressive as in talc. Recently, we had a patient who uh, presented with chyle thorax. We did tube ligation. He's still draining very high numbers every day. Uh, so uh, we did VATS and we did bl- talc pleurodesis. Uh, his X-ray shows exact image of ARDS, but luckily he was not in... Uh, Uh, ARDS yet, but he was treated as a patient of ARDS. I never saw a patient who received talc, a proper talc, without showing some changes in the lung associated with ARDS. Comment على نفس النقطة اللي الدكتور شادي ذكرها الخاصة بدكتور فراس اللي هي 50% جلوكوز. أنا حابب أعرف تفاصيل أكتر عن النقطة ديت لأن أنا لا أتصور يعني إيه رو سيرفيس أريا لايك لانج أم بلورا وادخل بهاي كونسن يس يس فهذا هاي one of the two most important consideration whenever you are doing uh, glucose pleurodesis or 50% dextrose pleurodesis is that there will be abnormal very high drainage in the next few days extremely high because of the oncotic pressure differences between the pleura and the uh, surf- the fluid And another thing, if there is very extensive air leak, it's an amazing medium for bacteria growth and complication by empyema. And we had a patient who underwent LVRS, complicated with persistent air leak. And one of the consultants uh, decided that he will do uh, dextrose pleurodesis. And immediately in next uh, day, He started to spike fever, and uh, on post, uh, after the pleurodesis, post of day three, he, uh, there was pus coming out, and he ended up with decortication and in bioma. Okay, well, يعني إحنا مش هنعرف نرد على النقطة دي إلا لما الدكتور فراس بس يعني يبقى معانا. شكرا يا فندم. أنا بس كمان بسأل عن النقطة. What is the sure indication to go back for? prolonged air leak امتى ادخل العمليات تاني للحاله ديت شكرا لحضرتك فن طيب ماشي اتفضل طيب انا اعتقد ان باليوم السابع بعد سبعة ايام من اليوم السابع بوست اب دي 7 اوف بيرزيستنت اير ليك اند يو اكستند يو تراي ذا كونزرفاتيف ميجرز از واز منشند باي دكتور شادي وذير از نو ريسبونس اور ذا بيشنت بيكمينج مور سيمتوماتيك For example, subacute emphysema increasing, will uh, more hardy. I would take him back. My mantar, yani my cut line, deadline is uh, day seven. Ah, yani انت بتقول حياتك ان انت reop في اليوم السابع. يمكن معلش انا هختلف معاكم في النقطه دي شويه دكتور محمد دكتور محمد بس لانه رفع ايده بعد اذنكم ازيك دكتور ياسر بيز اتفضل دكتور محمد الحمد لله اتفضل يا فندم. ديسكشن طيب وكنت بس عايز اسال هل في حد من اور كوليج عنده خبره في في البلازما 
في حالات الميجر اور ليج هو يعني اسمح لي انا هرد على حضرتك البلازما دي يعني احنا انا اشتغلناها حالتين بس نتائجها كويسه بس ما عنديش يعني ما عنديش حاجه اقدر اقول لك ريفرنس يعني بالنسبه لا. للحالات البلازما ده ده بالنسبه لي ما اعرفش باقي الزملاء برضه يقدروا لو حد ليه خبره يتفضل يعني هلا بتوقعش انه بالليترشر there is too many cases about the plasma uh, I have reviewed this بس ما ممكن تلقى platelet gel ممكن تلاقي ethanolamin ممكن تلاقي اشياء غير البلازما itself لا في نقطة الدكتور عيسى انه back to surgery بال 7 day um, يمكن um, this is a very a very difficult to be said and والله على اليوم السابع ارجع لسبب most of the of the authors most of the authorities they advise uh, uh, to wait especially if the tendency is decreasing يعني the indication for to go early if you have a collapsed lung or there is a persistent pneumothorax and the tendency is increasing rather than decreasing. So you should depend, مثل ما حكيت على ثلاث شغلات اللي هم volume وال tendency of the air leak um, وال grade تبعه. فإذا كان والله ال tendency is decreasing while to go back so early يعني ما هو عم بخس يعني افرض انه كان عندك بتستخدم انت digital, uh, digital drainage system و او بتستخدم السبجكتيف اسسمنت سيرفوليو او سان وباليوم الخامس لقيت والله انه جريد 3 باليوم السابع لقيته جريد 2 سو ذا تندنسي از ديكريسينج وصلت اليوم السابع هو جريد 2 اي ويل نوت جو باك ما هو عم بقل سو اي ويل اوبزرف ذا ذا ثري ثينجز اللي حكينا عنهم بموضوع الاسسمنت اوف ذا ليك اذا هذول اللي هم الفوليوم والتندنسي والنقطه الثالثه اللي هو البرفورمانس ستيتس اوف ذا بيشنت اذا هذول انا عندي اياهم كويسين واي تو جو ايرلي يعني ليه ما تروح على خيار تحط للمريض هايمليش بالب تروح على البيت تمام انا اعتقد برضو ان الدكتور عيسى كان يقصد اليوم السابع هو اعتمد على حته ان ده المين ديفينيشن عندي عشان اقول ده برولونجد وان هو مش امبروفد بالعكس هو بيديتيريوريت يعني بالظبط اذا هيك يس آه ما, يعني ما في خلاف الليك عمال بيسوق الانفيزيما بتزيد مش عارفين كنترول yeah. انا هبقى معاه في النقطه دي ان احنا اه ممكن 100% العيان تاني 100% ونري ايفالويت yeah. انما لو لقينا اي بريق للتحسن الدنيا بتقل ووصلنا فعلا لليوم السابع اعتقد ان احنا ندي فرصه اطول وبالذات ان حضراتكم وضحتوا ان في عندي كذا مانوفر تاني انا ممكن استعمله يعني الفالف ممكن يبقى متاح عندي نجرب البلوريديسس باكتر من طريقه عشان ما اعرضش العيان تاني لري اوبريشن يعني طيب حضراتكم في اي حد ليه اي اسئله تاني او استفسار في اي نقطه لو تسمح لي بس في عندي يعني نقطة بالنسبة للدكتور رياض حكى على موضوع البرونكال ستامب او حالات مثلا الليمينكتومي هذا طبعا ديفرنت توبيك ممكن يكون ايرلي بس غير الفالف اند برونكال فالف استخدمنا الامبلاتسر الامبلاتس ديفايس اللي هو استخدموا الكارديك سيرجنز في الفورامين اوفل كلوجر الامبلاتس يعني بكون ريل رود من خلال برونكوسكوب وبس بده يكون هذا طبعا المريض يكون عامل زي ثراكوتومي او اوبن ويندو تو انتروديوس الامبلاتس كاستمايد نحكي كاستمايد امبلاتس ديفايس شكرا جزيلا وللامسيه الجميله شكرا شكرا جميعا آه يعني اسمحوا لي برضو اسال تاني لو في اي سؤال او حاجه في الموضوع الموضوع مهم وكلنا بنواجهه والاساتذه بصراحه غطوه باسلوب رائع وغطوا تقريبا كل النقط اللي احنا يعني دايما بنسال عنها ما فيش حد ليه اي استفسار او اسئله السلام عليكم دكتور ياسر سلام عليكم الله هو بس بالنسبه للجلوكوز احنا كنا في مصر في الصاد العباسيه كنا بنستخدمنا بعض الاحيان الفيسكم وهو ماتيريال بتتحلل بالجلوكوز 5% يعني كل الازر ماتيريال اعتقد انها بتتحلل بالنورمال سلاين 
لكن هو الفيس كام الحاجه الوحيده اللي كان بيتحلل بالجلوكوز 5% فمش عارف هل دي الطريقه اللي هو دكتور فراس يقصدها ولا لا فراس يقصدها يعني مش عارف بقى هل هي ولا لا يعني هل هو بيحط الجلوكوز 50% هو دكتور فراس علق قال يا فندم ديكس روز 50% تو برديوس ا لاير اوف شوجر شوجر ذات سيلز ذا ليك اند هيلبس ويز بلورو فايسز اي ثينك بلورو ديسز بس باي ميستيكلي ريتن لايك ذات فهو بيقول ان الشوجر الشوجر لاير بتسيل لكن مش 5% يا دكتور محمد 50 50 50 اه 50 يعني نخلي بس الدكتور فراس يكتب لنا تفصيل شويه للنقطه دي ولو الزملاء محتاجين ممكن يعملوا ديسكشن مع الجروب حتى بتاعنا يعني ده بحيث ان احنا نشوف برضو لعل وعسى تكون نقطه يعني مفيده لينا لو نقدر نستخدمها لان هو موضوع سهل يعني لو هو يفهم. فعلا اه متاكد ان هو حاجه مفيده هيبقى سهل بالنسبه لنا كلنا تمام يا فندم طيب انا عندي عندي بس معلش يا دكتور اخر حاجه عندي اتفضل يا حبيبي الله يكرمك آه امتى نعمل بلورال تنت انترا اوبريتفلي بلورال تنت بلورال تنت اه ايوه فن الدكتور عيسى متهالي هو الانترا اوبر آه طبعا البلورال تنت كان بي دان مينلي ان اني ابيكال ريسكشن بيكوز يو ويل ريليس ذا بلورا اند كفر ذا فور اكزامبل اف يو ار دوينج رايت ابر او ليفت ابر يو كان يوز ذا بلورا ريفلكشن اند كفر ات بس اولسو ات كان بي يوز تو كفر ذا ستامبس هايلم and other uh, uh, brown areas of uh, leak. And the most important thing when you, whenever you are doing the tent is to have a chest tube on top and chest tube below the, the tent to help the suck out there and create some sort of vacuum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. طيب احنا كده وصلنا لمتهالي لنهايه الميتنج بتاعنا ما شاء الله احنا يعني كنا بنقول ميتنج هياخد ساعه دخلنا على حوالي ساعتين اهو وده طبعا ان ده اللي فيدل على يعني قوه المحاضرات اللي بتتعرض و ويعني واكتر من كده الزملاء اللي مشرفينا ومنورينا في الميتنج اللي من غيرهم ما فيش ميتنج هيتم يعني احنا بنشكركم جميعا وبنشكر حرصكم على العلم والتعلم وان شاء الله يعني الامور تبقى مفيده للجميع الف شكر دكتور عيسى والف شكر دكتور شادي طبعا الدكتور عامر على الاداره الجميله الله يكرمك الدكتور عامر على راس المجموعه اللي بنشكرها وبنشكر كل الزملاء اللي شرفونا ونلقاكم على خير ان شاء الله شكرا جزيلا لحضراتكم ونلقاكم على خير يا رب